let's give the Lord a hand of praise. Thank God we got some talented uh, musicians and singers and worshipers. I remember uh, about 13 years ago, I was on the drums, and there was another guy playing the keyboard, and I guarantee we didn't sound like this. Amen. So thank God for where he's brought us to. And uh, yeah, it's a blessing. We have a, a powerful worship team. And amen. Give them a hand. Amen. They're always working hard. And amen. Well, I got the privilege to share the word today, uh, the first service with you. So turn your Bibles with me to, uh, you could turn to Luke chapter 14. The title of the, this message will be Fill the House, Filling the House, fill, fill this house, Filling this house. Can you feel me? Amen. As you turn there, uh, I want to read a, a different scripture, but we're going to camp out there at Luke chapter 14. And so you could, you could kind of be there, and then I'm going to read this scripture, and then we'll pray. Proverbs 29, 18. It says, where there is no vision, where there is no revelation, the people cast off restraint. But happy is he who keeps the law. Let's pray. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, we come before you this morning, God. We thank you for your presence in this place, Lord, and for calling us and for choosing us and for meeting us here, Lord. We ask that you would take full control, God, of the preaching of your word. Lord, that you would use it to minister to each and every one of us here today, Lord. We ask that you would just move by your power, by your spirit, in your mighty name, Jesus. Everybody says, Amen. If you're online, God bless you also. Uh, we're glad that you joined us right there. Uh, hopefully, you're at home for the first service, but you'll be here for the next service. Amen. Praise God. Uh, Proverbs 2019 says, Where there is no vision, where there's no revelation, the people cast off restraint. I was thinking about this scripture because this month, our topic is going to kind of be about vision, and it's going to be kind of celebrating our pastors being here for 14 years. We kind of talked about it last week, and, and we had a special service, and we took up a pledge. And if you weren't able to be a part of that, you can still be a part of that, because we're talking about vision, and the vision continues, not only for 14 years, but beyond. And we got to see where God has taken us from... Uh, humble beginnings like I said with me on the drums I couldn't even keep a beat I'd be like I didn't know what I was doing they would even tell pastor would be there singing pastor was the worship leader and then he would turn around and be like hey just stop playing <laughs> and I'd be like all right but to see where we come humble beginnings all the way to now and then to look forward to where God is going to bring us in the future as Victory Outreach Reno. And it's the vision that keeps us going forward. It's the vision that the Bible says restrains us. And uh, I believe that that it's kind of a, it, the imagery is kind of like a straight jacket. It keeps us locked in. It keeps us focused. It keeps us going in the right direction. It locks us in. If I don't have vision, anything can distract me, anything can pull me away from what I'm really supposed to be doing. How many have vision today? How many have this vision today? We have our local vision, and, and God has given a vision to our pastors to be the largest church in northern Nevada. Amen. But that means you're going to have to fill the house. And we don't want to just be large just to be large, just to, so we can say, we're, look how big we are and we're great. No, but the larger the church is, the larger the impact we can make right here, but also all over the world. And so we've been, uh, so this month is, this is what we're talking about, vision. You're going to hear uh, a few more messages about vision and building and uh, maybe battling and, uh, yeah, w running with the vision and possessing the promise and going forward. And so, but today I want to talk about when it comes to the vision, we must fill the house. Fill the house with souls. I think we could pack out the first service. I think we could pack out the first service. I think you could tell everybody, tell your neighbors, tell your coworkers, hey, 
come to the 9 a.m. service, and then the rest of the day you can do whatever you want. Hello? Actually, come a little bit early. I'll buy you breakfast. And then you can have some of the word and then go home and do whatever you want. Hello? Can we do that? I think we can. Look at this. This is, we have, Friday night is bigger than this. Can I say that? But I, I believe that it, it's up to us. It's up to you and I. We're going to find out right now. But it's up to us to fill the house. Part of the vision is filling the house. If we're going to be the largest, we're going to be big, we're going to be mega, we got to fill the house. That means you and I have a part to play. They're not going to just come. They're not going to just, you know, stumble upon it. But you and I have a part to play. A few things about vision, though, as we uh, look at it this month, is vision shows us where we're headed. Vision provides motivation. This is a good one. Vision propels us through obstacles. How many know you're going to go through it? We're going to go through it. But if I have vision and if I've grabbed a hold of this vision, when I go through certain things, I'm going to be able to be pushed through or I will push through because I have vision. I have direction. I have purpose. Vision supplies the why of what I do. Vision supplies the why of what I do. I don't just come here because I have nothing better to do. If I don't have vision, that might be why. Well, I got nothing better to do on Sunday, but once I have something better to do, I will not be here because I don't have vision. But the vision keeps me and it, it helps me to know why I do what I do. It propels me forward. Vision supplies the why. Why do I sacrifice? Why do I commit? Why do I show up? Why do I prepare? Why do I do what I do? And our vision is God's vision. We want to reach souls. We want to reach people. Turn with me, or you guys, are you already, hopefully you turned there, maybe you didn't turn away yet. Luke chapter 14. Can I read a little bit? You came for the word. Luke chapter 14, verse 15. I'm going to read it, this parable, and then we're going to jump in on how we fill the house. It says right here, now when one of those who sat at the table with him, Jesus, heard these things, he said to him, blessed is he who shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. Then he said to him, a certain man gave a supper, a great supper, and invited many, and sent his servant at supper time to say to those who were invited, come, for all things are now ready. But they all with one accord began to make excuses. The first said, I have bought a piece of ground and I must go and see it. Wow. I ask you to have me excused. Verse 19. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen and I'm going to test them. Wow. I would rather work than go to the supper. And another said, uh, still another said, I have married a wife. And therefore I cannot make it. My wife told me I can't come. Wow. I asked that you have me excused. So that servant came and reported these things to his master. Then the master of the house, being angry, said to the servant, Go out quickly into the streets and lanes of the city and bring here the poor and the maimed and the lame and the blind. And the servant said, Master, it is done as you commanded, and still there is room. Then the master said to the servant, go out into the highways and the hedges and compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. For I say to you that none of those men who were invited shall taste my supper. Wow. Excuses. How many got excuses? Come on, tell the truth. We all got excuses. We all know how to make excuses. But when it comes to filling the house, we have to be a people that recognizes excuses and learns how to avoid them or kill them within our lives. The main thing, I think, as, and we learn it from here, the main thing that will keep us from fulfilling the vision is excuses. Right? Can you guys agree? One thing that will keep us from fulfilling or filling this house or fulfilling the vision is excuses. I can't do it because or 
you don't understand my situation, and it's like this, and we tell these long stories, and uh, I can't make it today because I'm sick. <laughs> can't you hear I'm sick? <laughs> I can't make it. We have excuses for everything. I think as we see this uh, right here is the main excuses that it highlights are very common to us today. And I think when it comes to uh, filling the house, either we have excuses or we deal with people that give excuses. Maybe you don't have excuses. You know, you guys are here. You don't have an excuse. You're here. But we do deal with people that have excuses. Hello, somebody. Hey, where you at today, bro? I didn't see you. Oh, yeah, I had to fold clothes. Oh, I couldn't make it because I had to, uh, you know, blah, blah, blah. But we see here that in this area, what, uh, what Jesus highlights is uh, three areas is possessions, career, and family or relationships. That's what our, uh, I think those are main excuses. I can't go all in because I got to take care of my possessions. He said, I bought a piece of land and I need to go check it out. Really? You can't check that out later after the supper? You can't go check it out another day? You can't go check it out? Why do you got to check it out on this day when we're feasting in the house of the Lord? Why do you got to do it this day? Why do you got to worry about it? You got six other days you can worry about it. Today is the day that we come in fellowship with Jesus. Today is the day that we come and we feast in the house of the Lord. Why do you got to worry about it today? Possessions. He said, uh, I, I got to go. When you look up this, when you study this, this invitation wasn't like a last minute. It wasn't like, hey, I'm passing by and, hey, you want to come to the supper? This was known, this invitation was sent well in advance, possibly months ahead of time. They knew the supper was coming. They knew Sunday was coming. You knew Sunday was coming. You were able to get ready for it, but whatever, at that last minute, oh, I got to go do something else. Oh, I got something better to do. What you're saying is this is not important. Not you. You're here. It's those that are not here are saying, hey, this is not that important to me. You see, possessions are, are sometimes an excuse. Career sometimes is an excuse. And then family or relationships is sometimes an excuse. He said, I just got married. Wow. Wow. Your excuse is my wife won't let me go. Yeah, I don't think that's going to cut it on the last day, brother. I don't think that's going to cut it when you stand before Jesus. I don't think that's going to cut it in the last time. When we get to the supper, when we get to the, it's time for the banquet with Jesus. They were like, oh, you know, I wasn't here on time because, I, you know, my wife said no. But when it comes to fulfilling the vision and filling the house, I need to be all in. I need to be all in before possessions, before career, before relationships. I need to be all in for Jesus, for Jesus, for Jesus. Can we be all in for Jesus? When it comes to excuses, we need to recognize them and let them be to their excuses. You don't have excuses, but we invite people that have excuses and we try to get them to come to the supper on Sunday. And they have excuses. The master didn't bother with their excuses. Fine, go get other people then. You don't want to be here? We'll find other people that need to be here. I like this because it, the master doesn't say, oh, go ask them again. Go check with them a third time. Go tell them we'll give them a bigger portion if they do get here. No, you, you got your opportunity. You got your invitation. You don't want it? God bless you. We'll see you when we see you. Another thing about excuses, this is heavy right here. My excuses affect the master. He got angry. He said, what? I, invite, I, cre I made this supper. I made this feast. I made this banquet and you, for you, and you don't want to come? Anybody ever stood you up before? Come on. You've been stood up before. Come on. You men stood up. You're like, hey, you know, we're going to go on a date. Get this thing planned out. She doesn't show. He doesn't show. I'll be there at 615. 
He doesn't show. Hello? How did you feel? Rejected, angry, disappointed, let down. My excuses affect the master. So, what did he say? He said, invite the poor, the maimed, the lame, and the blind. Invite the poor, the lame, the maimed, and the blind. I like this is because uh, these kind of people don't have excuses. He said, go find the people that don't have excuses. Go to them and let them fill the house. I invited the people. They didn't come. Now go find the people that don't have excuses. Who doesn't have excuses? Poor people. I got nowhere else to be. I don't got a job. I don't got nothing to do. I can't go anywhere. I can't do anything. I'm going to be in the house of the Lord. Jesus said, go find these people. Let's look at these people real quick. The poor are those reduced to beggary, beggars. They have no wealth, no influence, no position, no honor. Woo, that's me. When God grabbed a hold of me, I had nothing. I had nothing. I had nothing going, nothing to offer. And he said, hey, I want you to come to the banquet. I want you to come to the feast. You're invited. And I'm like, "Woo! you accept me there? I can come in? I don't even got to pay? I get to go to the buffet for free? And it's not my birthday? Yes. I'm there. And he said, come in. Those who are poor are those with no Christian virtues. I have nothing good in me. These are those that are destitute of eternal riches, poor, broken, nothing going for them, spiritually, physically, financially, poor, empty. That was me. Actually, I wasn't just poor. I was in debt. I was in debt to my sin. I had nothing to offer because I was in debt. You ever been in debt? You, are, you, don't, you can't give freely because you're in debt. You have, you have something that you have to pay that's held over your head. That was me. In debt to my sin. And Jesus said, I want you. The debtor, I want you. You got nothing to offer. You can't pay for anything. I'm like, yeah, come on, let me in. <laughs> These are who, uh, the, as a servant of the Lord, you're in the house today. Now it's up to you and I to fill the house and find these people that are poor, destitute of eternal riches. You're not going to heaven? Oh, you want to come to a banquet? You're broke? You want to come to the banquet? You got nothing going for you? You want to come to the banquet? We got a party going on on Sunday morning, 9 a.m. You want to come to a party? Get over here. Revelation 3, 17 says, Because you say I am rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, blind, and naked. Choo! Galatians 4, 9, But now... After you have known God, or rather are known by God, how is it that you turn again to the weak and beggarly elements to which you desire again to be in bondage? Wow. After you've been invited to the banquet, why would you turn back to being a beggar? You've been invited to the celebration. You are in the house. You are one of them filling the house. Why would I want to turn back to begging. I got the free buffet all day. Why would you want to go back to begging? Another thing he says, go find the poor, go find the maimed. Those that have taken damage to some part of the body. I was looking this up and I was trying to understand maimed and lame. I'm like, isn't that kind of the same thing? But maimed has to do with outward circumstances affecting me. Lame has to do with inward circumstances affecting me outwardly. We're going to get into it right now. But this is taking damage to some part of the body. How many have been hurt? I need to look for those that have been hurt. I need to go out into the highways and the byways and look for those that have been hurt and compel them to come in. Those that have been maimed by circumstance, by life, that have been beat down, that have been hurt, that have been broken. I need to find them and say, hey, you want to be a part of a better body? Well, I have a place for you to be today, Sunday morning. 
and maimed. God wants to restore those who are maimed. If you weren't here yesterday, uh, you missed out. Pastor Rick broke it off, the discipleship, uh, and he talked about the man with the withered hand. Some circumstance or other affected his hand, and he, he became shriveled up, and he could no longer work like he needed to. But this is referring also to this, where the outward circumstance affects us, and I can no longer be of use to the people around me. But God says, the master says, go into the highways and the byways and find those who are of no benefit to anybody else and bring them into the banquet. Find those who are broken by circumstance, by the things around them, and bring them into the banquet. Bring them into the feast. That's who I want in the house. Revelation 21.4, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. I came in maimed, but God has restored my life. The circumstances around me have affected me, and I came in broken and damaged. But when I came into the banquet, when I came into the feast, God restored my life. God gave me purpose, and now I no longer am no benefit, but I am a great benefit to those around me. Psalm 70, God wants to restore you, and God wants to make us useful in the kingdom. And now that you're here, uh, one of the ways to be useful is to go out and find those who are still maimed. Those that are damaged by circumstance, damaged by life, that have been hurt and broken. Those that have grown up without dads and moms. Those that have grown up in broken houses. And those who have grown up in abuse. And those who have grown up in circumstances of life that have damaged them. That's who I want to find and bring into the house. That's who I want to find and say, hey, if you want to be restored, I have a place for you to come. I have a place for you to belong. Psalm 71, 20 says, You who have shown me great and severe troubles shall revive me again and bring me up again from the depths of the earth. Psalm 147, 3 says, He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. That's good news. Those who are maimed, God is able to make whole. Those who have been damaged, God is able to repair. Then he says, go and find the lame. This is, uh, so maimed has to do with outward circumstances affecting my life. Lame, I was looking it up, has to do with inward circumstances affecting me outwardly. And I looked it up in Mark 9, 45. It, uh, is, uh, or, well, lame is lame by sin. Mark 9, 45, he says, if your foot causes you to sin. Cut it off. If your foot caught, and what is lame? It, literally, it means without a foot. Literally, you can't walk. And spiritually, some of us came in here without one of our feet. Spiritual circumstances and the sin and our choices and our decisions brought us to a place where we were spiritually lame. Not just broken by outward circumstances, but it's what I did. It's how I sinned against God. It's how I sinned against others. It's how I sinned against myself that now I came and I was lame and I couldn't even get myself to the house of the Lord. I needed somebody to come and bring me in. I needed somebody to come and open the door for me. Lame. Lame by sin. Have you ever been lamed by sin? Sin separates us from God. Sin breaks us down physically, emotionally, spiritually. And I need somebody. We need to be that person also that, that finds those that have been damaged by their own sin. Not by the sins of others, but hey, you recognize that you are a sinner. You have offended God. But the one you offended is inviting you to a party for you. You want to come to the banquet or not? This banquet's for you, and I'll help you get there. That's crazy. I offended the master, and the master still wants me over at the house. My sin is against God alone, and he said, I want you to come over and eat with me. What? That's why he was so angry, because the first people, he said, hey, I created this banquet for you, and 
and then you say no? Really? After I've already sinned against him, and then he invited me over in his good grace and love and patience and mercy to come on over and eat with me. And I say, no, I'm too busy. I got other stuff. I got other plans. Thanks for the invite, though. I'll take a rain check. No, there's no rain check for this one, pal. This is the inward circumstances that make us lame. Proverbs 14, 12 says, There is a way that seems to right to a man, but its end is the way of death. And then there, he said, go find those who are blind. Mentally. Mental blindness. We are blind to the things of God. Blind to what we're really doing. Blind to our, 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 our emptiness. Blind to uh, the reality of our sin. Blind to the reality of God's goodness in our lives. John 9, 25, he says, he answered and said, whether he is a sinner or not. Oh, this is good. Remember this guy? The blind guy. Jesus healed him. And they say, hey, who healed you? And this guy said, hey, look, I don't have really too many answers. All I know is I was blind at one time, but now I can see. He said, hey, look, I, I was a blind guy, and I don't know if you guys got beef with Jesus. All I know is that he came here, he touched my life, and now I can see again. All I got to say is if you want to ask him, go talk to Jesus. I like that guy, man. But how many of us came in blind and we need to be able to tell somebody else, hey, I don't have all the answers, I don't know all the scriptures, but one thing I do know, I came into the house, I came into the men's home, I came into the women's home, I came through the doors of Victory Outreach Reno, I was blind, but now I see. That's all I know. If you want to know more, why don't you come and check it out and ask for yourself. Romans 2, 19, it says, and are confident that you yourself are a guide to the blind. This is our job now. I am now blind leading the blind. I now have sight, and I now need others. And I need to lead others that are blind to the one that gives sight. Hello, somebody. And we are confident you yourself are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness. These four groups of people are those who have no excuses. They are so empty, they have no excuse. I got, I got nothing else to say. I got no, I can't even say no. You caught me doing nothing right here. I can't even say, I'm in the highways and the byways. You caught me right there under the bridge. What am I going to say? You caught me living in a tent. I'm, you know I'm not busy. You caught me at the Connections house. You know I don't got bigger plans than this. He said, go and find those who have no excuses. And it's important real quick is that we, we make note that you and I today, I, I believe that in this, in this parable that you and I could be considered the servant that goes back and forth. And now we're in the house. We're going to be in the banquet. But it's important that you and I remember to guard ourselves from excuses. Guard ourselves from comfort. Guard ourselves from covetousness. Guard ourselves from what I don't have. Hello? I thought you came in broken. Why is this thing still holding you back? I came in, I was poor, maimed, lame, and blind. I think I was all four of these. How dare I come up with excuses at this point? I came in with nothing. I came in with nothing to offer. I came in with, I didn't have possession. I didn't have career. I didn't have relationships to hold me back. And now God blesses my life. How dare I use these things to hold me back from doing what he's told me to do? Maybe you didn't come in broken. Maybe you didn't come in, you know, maybe you came in another way. I don't know how you came in. Some of you came in underneath the door. You slid in. But this is the picture of all of us. Right before this parable, Jesus tells uh, he's at a he's at a dinner with uh, you know some some religious people, and 
Jesus tells them in verse uh, 12, he tells them right here, he said to those who invited him, whenever you give a dinner or a supper, do not ask your friends, your brothers, your relatives, nor your rich neighbors, lest they also invite you back and you be repaid. But when you give a feast, invite the poor, the maimed, the lame, and the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you. For you shall be repaid at the resurrection. This is good right here. I think that I thank God that Jesus Christ embodies this. He invited you. Hello. He invited me. I added no benefit. I can't repay him. This is the gospel message right here. I can't repay him for the goodness and the kindness that he's done towards me. I have nothing to benefit him back for inviting me over for supper. This is for you and I today. He's called us and he said, hey, I know that you have nothing to offer. I know where you are in your sin debt, but I love you anyways, and I want you to come and partake of what I have for you. So if we're going to fill the house, there's three things that we need to do. I think we need to fill up this service. I said it. I'm going to keep saying it. Uh, as often as I get to preach on the first service, I'm going to keep saying it. But I think we should fill this up. But there's three things that we need to do that we learn from this parable. We need to pray. We need to prepare. And we need to preach. Pray, 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 pray. Prepare and preach. We see right here that the servants, uh, as they continue to go back and forth to the master, they are connected. If I want to be able to reach those that are poor, maimed, lame, and blind, I need to be connected to the master. If I'm a servant in the house, I need to be connected to the master. And the way I connect with my master is in prayer. I like how they use their free access back and forth to the master. They come and say, hey, hey, hey. Uh, hey, Master, uh, we went and told these other guys, and they gave us excuses. Prayer. They came and said, hey, what do you want us to do next? Go out and do this. Okay, we did that. What do you want us to do next? Go out and do this again. As servants in the house of the Master, you and I need to be servants of prayer. You and I need to use the access that we have to the Master. The Bible says, come boldly before the throne of grace. If... if <laughs> If you want to simplify what Jesus really did for us on the cross, Jesus opened a way for you and I to have connection and fellowship with God. And then you don't want to come to the supper? After everything that Jesus did, I don't want to come and fellowship with Jesus. I don't want to come fellowship with God. I want to, woo! I need to pray. If I want to fill the house, I need to pray. We should be a people of prayer. We should be servants of prayer. Now, in 1 John 5, 14, now this is the confidence that we have in him. If we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. You know how we're going to fill this house? When you and I start praying for our neighbors by name, by name, not just generic prayer. Hey, Lord, I pray that you bring people in, a sleepy prayer. And I pray, Lord, in the name of Jesus, I pray for these people to get saved. No, but pray for your neighbor by name. Do you know your neighbor's name? If you live in an apartment or you live in a neighborhood, do you know your neighbors and can you pray for them? And watch it. What did he say? If we're going to fill the house, we need to be connected to the master. John 15, 7, abiding in Christ. He said, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. This is abiding in prayer. This is praying without ceasing. This is coming to the master. 
This is praying for those, praying on purpose, for a purpose. Oh, this is a good one, too. You could uh, highlight this. Psalm, I believe it's Psalm 2.8. He said, ask of me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. Ask. I think the problem sometimes is we are not asking. Am I asking for my neighbor by name? Or the person at the gas station. You see them all the time. What's their name? They got the badge right here. You say, hey, so-and-so, hey, how are you? I'm praying for you. You're going to come to church soon. They're like, yeah, whatever. Next thing you know, you keep seeing them over and over again. And then they're here. In prayer, I need to ask God for a sensitivity for who he wants to bring into the house. What do the servants do? They say, hey, what do you want us to do now? Who do you want us to reach out to? He said, go into the highways and the byways. We did that. Now go find those who are poor, maimed, lame, and blind. Okay, let's do it. Another thing we need to do is prepare. We should be ready. You and I should be ready as the servants to preach the message that he has given us. They were ready for, they were prepared because they spent time in prayer. These two go hand in hand. I can't be prepared if I'm not in prayer. But also I need to understand the message. What is the message? This is the message, brothers and sisters. This is the message, the good news that, hey, you were on your way to hell, but Jesus made a way for you to not go to hell anymore. You were in debt, but there is a way for you to be debt free. You have been guilty, but there is now a way for you to be justified. That's the message. But do I know it? Or do I even remember? I can just go back. We can just be like the blind guy. Hey, I don't have a big message, but I have a message. And if you're blind like me, I know the guy that can make you see again. It doesn't take a lot, but as I am a servant of the master, I should learn of his message, the message of the master. What does he want me to do? What does he want me to say? I need to be prepared. First Peter 3.15, he says, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to anyone who asks a reason for the hope that is in you. I don't want to miss, I've missed opportunities. Have you ever missed the opportunity to preach and, and to share and to invite and to compel somebody to come in? Anybody or just me? I've missed opportunities and I look back and I'm like, dang, I feel convicted. My whole day is ruined. Like, dang, I should have said this, 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 and this. But because maybe I wasn't in prayer, then I wasn't prepared. When I get into prayer, then I could be prepared to give the message. I could be prepared to have a response. How, why are you so joyful? Why are you so happy? Why are you so glad? Why, why, nothing gets you down. That's an opportunity. Ah, you want to know something? Let me tell you. I was blind, but now I see. We should position ourselves to those the master wants to bring in. Again, in prayer, he shows you who. And then after in prepare, preparing, then I position myself next to that person. Who does God want to bring in? Those without excuse. Those that are broken and destitute and have nothing. I need to position myself next to them to bring them in. Position myself. 2 Timothy 2.15, be diligent to present yourself approved. A worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Uh, this is going to be my Bethy plug for you. If you're in here today, you should get into the Bethy class. Whenever they have them, you should sign up. Well, I don't feel like being the pastor. I don't feel like, who cares? Do you feel like getting closer to the Lord? then you should get into this class. You should learn. You should have a hunger and a desire to pursue the things of God and the relationship with God. I didn't, I didn't start taking classes because I got this word and I want to be a pastor. I just want to grow in the Lord. I just want to understand my master more. So I'm going to go and take classes. I'm going to learn. Does it cost money? Yes, it does. But guess what? This is all I do. This is what I live for. So I'm going to pursue it, and I want to know the Lord. I want to study to show myself approved. I want to rightly divide the word of truth. I want to be able to have an answer when people ask. 
And the third thing here, we get ready to finish, is then we need to pray, prepare, and then preach. When the opportunity comes, I need to present the gospel. I need to present the good news. Not, uh, not simply, you know, Jesus can make your life better. That's not the gospel. The gospel is you don't have to go to hell. The good news is you don't have to pay your own debt anymore. And that debt is death. That debt is eternal damnation. The good news is that your debt has been paid. All you got to do is accept the free gift. That's good news. What's good news to a dying man? You will live. What's good news to a sinner is that you don't have to pay for your sin. The good news is that Jesus paid the price. It's up to you and I to proclaim the invitation to the poor, the maimed, the lame, and the blind. But if I haven't prayed and I haven't prepared... Uh, be careful if you want to go out and preach. Romans 10, 14, it says, How then shall they call on him whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? Jesus is sending you and I today as the servants into the highways and the byways, into the hedges, to find those who are poor, maimed, lame, and blind. You and I today, as the servants, are his preachers, are his messengers of the gospel. It's up to you and I. We're going to fill the house. We're going to see this vision continue. It's up to you and I to go out and to compel them to come in. Real quick, compelling is a good word. He says, this is actually, he says, by force, threats, permissions, and treaties or by other means. The master told the servants, whatever you got to do for those that are broken and have nothing to offer, get them, compel them to come to the banquet because I want to fill my house. I want to have a good party. I want to bless. I want to take care of. I want to give to those that can't give back. Compel, do whatever you got to do to get them here without sin. Hello, somebody. I see some of your light bulbs went on. Yes. He said, use any way to get them to the banquet, any means necessary. If we are to see the vision continue, we need to compel those people to come in. We need to compel others that were like you and I. Poor, maimed, lame, blind, whatever it is, we need to compel them. How do I compel? What does your walk look like? What does your talk sound like? What does your attitude look like? The women preached on, on Friday. They talked about uh, the sound. They talked about your smell. And they talked about your touch. How do you feel? Can, can you feel me? Can you feel your presence? How is your attitude? How is your talk? How is your, are you full of joy at work? Full of anger and frustration because he had to get up and come here again. Are you irritated and angry at, in traffic, or, or are you are you yelling at your kids all day long and your neighbors hear you and you're never happy? You're fighting with your spouse, and then you, and then you come out. Hey, why don't you come to church? I'm like, whoa, I don't want to go to that. Please, no, I don't. Yeah, no, I don't want to go to that place. You sound miserable. Are we compelling those around us to come in? Are we compelling? Is our life compelling? Is our walk and our talk and our, and our sound? Is what we do compelling to others? That means i got to check my life. I gotta, the way I, I, I hold myself as a servant of the master, and I'm going out to find those that are poor, maimed, lame, and blind, and I'm representing the master. Am I a good representation? Am I a good reflection? Of who he is. I'm going to ask the worship team to come. We need to be men and women. We need to be servants of the master that are authentic. What compels people is authenticity and sincerity. Caring for them. Not just inviting them to the party. Not just inviting them to the service. Not just, hey, you know, Jesus loves you, uh, whatever. 
But do I care for their soul? Do I understand that if they do not accept the invitation, they will not sup with the Lord? They do not eat with him. He says at the end there, those who did not accept the invitation will not eat of my supper. Do I understand that those who do not accept the invitation, do I understand what that means? Do I really care? I need to be authentic. That means it's not counterfeit. And uh, that means I need to pray. Uh, I need to study. I need to prepare. And I need to go out. And I need to represent God to the people around me. Let's all stand in this place. Hallelujah. Can we do that? Can we fill the house? Can we bring somebody? Can you do this, actually? Before we do anything, before we sing a song, I, I want you to pull out your phone. We're going to close like this. We know I don't ever do this. Pull out your phone. Come on. And I want you to text somebody and say, hey, next service starts in 30 minutes. Uh, however you want to tell them. Are you going to be here? Can we do that? Or, hey, maybe they're not in town, but, hey, can you join online? Maybe it's a loved one, and, 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 and they're not saved, and they're not a believer, and they're, you know they're poor, maimed, blind, and you know they need Jesus in their lives. You say, hey, you know what? Why don't you jump on YouTube in about 30 minutes? Why don't you join the service with us? Watch live with me. And then tell them, I want you here next Sunday. If you don't come today, I want you here next Sunday. Whatever you tell them, something like that. Just invite somebody on your phone. Say, I want to see you here. I want you to sit next to me next week. I want you to sit next to me next service. Now, as they play this song, I want you to come up to the front. If you texted somebody, and we're going to put this into practice. If you texted somebody, I want you to come to the front, and you're going to lift them up by name. Come, 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 and pray for them. And watch. We're going to believe together that God is going to move. If you texted Thank you for joining us on our online service. If you're ready to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, it's as simple as this prayer. Lord, I am a sinner and I accept you as my Lord. We'd love to see you here in person. God bless.